Okay, so um, here's our agenda for today, as you've seen. And I think uh, there's a couple questions that we have uh, in here right now. And if you want to add any agenda items, please feel free to. From a university effort perspectives, um, we're looking for what some meaningful topics for a mentoring program uh, might be. And so some examples would be uh, licensing or governance or DEI. And um, so, yeah, we're just curious what, what some mentoring topics might be that would be helpful to your efforts. Who would be mentoring who? So if, if um, you're developing a university open source program office and you are looking to help others inside your university understand the nature of open source, how it works, how they might measure the effect of the work that is being distributed through open source from your university. What are what are some things that you think the folks that you work with could use mentoring on? Does that help? Yep, thanks. So how to build a community. I see uh, someone is adding. Yeah, just because I know RIT have already been doing that explicit one where where they've um they did a presentation. Mike Nolan did a great presentation plus backstage on this actually, which I should try and find the link to. Yeah, that'd be great. About his like not even about the mentoring, about the whole mentorship program on this. So let me just try and find that. What about licensing and governance or I think somebody inadvertently erased the D and DEI. <laughs> I mean, is mentoring uh is mentoring something that you have considered doing or is on the roadmap for the work that's uh, taking place at your universities? Um, David, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I'm, I don't frame it as mentoring. Um, it's more like we have customers of the OSPO and they have questions in there. If we take it as a case by case and address their questions, maybe that's mentoring. No. Well, I think, I think where mentoring tends to emerge as a practice is as you perhaps wade into providing that kind of consulting advice, I would expect over time that there would be some questions that would be common or some gaps that would be common where um, a mentoring program would enable the efforts of the kind of consulting arrangement where you're sort of helping people on a one-off basis uh, evolve into something that is more scalable so that instead of you know mentoring people one-on-one -on -one with a mentoring program, you can start to mentor people in groups or train or help people who have gone through your process to mentor other people. Um, those are the kinds of things I'm thinking. I think the way this typically scales, like the way, so, you know, looking at it from a, from a corporate environment, the way we did this, the way we did this at VMware mm -hmm. was we didn't have a mentoring program at all ever. Um, we, um, the way we scaled the OSPO was uh, best practice guides. So we put together detailed guidance for people um, based on the frequent questions that we got, right? So we get a lot of people asking questions about licensing. We put together a guide about a particular license or something like that. So we had a really extensive best practice guide. And then we also had uh, a Slack channel where anybody could ask questions that they were having. And what we found was that it, it wasn't always the OSPO that were answering the questions, right? A lot of times it was other people from the business units who had run across something and gotten an answer from the OSPO and then shared that answer with, with someone else. 
So I've I've never seen people use mentoring programs as a way to scale an OSPO. Maybe that's why this it, it, it doesn't seem like this question is resonating well with with the university OSPOs, and that might be that might be why. I agree with that. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, add in, I just put something in there. Um, so the last time I heard folks talking explicitly about the mentorship program was in the kind of internship context. So I know that certain OSPOs are, um, and certain universities are very engaged with creating internship programs for open source. And then they they talk a lot about the mentorship um, and they're talking about not just what pe how people mentor, like as in, you know, they might be mentoring on how to um, do a contribution or something like that. But they're also talking about like how to sustain a mentorship pool and all that sort of thing. So there's there's kind of two elements. There's the there's the how to create a set of mentors and then there's um, and how to enable them. And then there's like what the mentors mentor about, if you get my gist. Mm -hmm. And is code for GovTech? That, yeah, that's an really, example of an internship program. Yes, and and they had a mentor guide. Let me find that for you, and I'll stick that in as oh, well. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. Have the, yeah, <laughs> hold on a minute. Oh, this is all this is all really uh, helpful. I think um, if there isn't, you know, if this is you know kind of these best practices that Don described, does that sound more resonant than uh, a mentoring program? Send to people but it sounds I, like yeah i wonder i wonder are i mean and i'm back to dawn's point i wonder are there like if, if you think more broadly about that idea of peer-to-peer -peer mentorship or helping um there probably are informal networks um or at least i think we know we've seen informal networks happen in, in universities where researchers are helping other researchers um uh both in terms of open source use as well as contribution and creation. Um, so that's, I mean, if you want to put that under the idea of mentorship, it may not be a formal mentorship program, but it's um, but it's definitely happening. Like that, uh, in fact, in many cases, I, I, I would assume, I don't know, I don't have exact uh, uh, evidence of this, but I would assume that in many cases, some OSPOs are involved in actually trying to surface up the guidance that might be coming out of those informal networks into best practice guides for, for various different disciplines and departments and things like that as well. Um, so, because we know that there's lots of shared knowledge in certain disciplines about certain types of open source projects and ones to get involved in. And that is, that's all happening regardless of whether OSPOs or people are consciously trying to manage it. Mm -hmm. What other people think? I'm curious what Mike Nolan thinks since we were just talking about him. Oh, is Did he, there? he just arrive? Yeah, he just I didn't see Mike come in. in. <laughs> this, uh, Mike hurt. Mike's ears were burning. Yeah, Claire was just evangelizing <laughs> your talk. From I was Fox. just saying how yeah. great your Fox backstage talk was on the topic. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, my my spidey sense was tingling, so I, uh, <laughs> I had to... apologies for being late today. Oh, no problem, Mike. So uh, Claire was just describing your your mentoring talk, and I believe shared a link to it up above under the word here. And uh, we were discussing just different uh, informal networking and other approaches that are taken uh, in spreading the the knowledge of open source in a university context and, and how what kinds of support or what kinds of uh, things might be useful for I don't want to say what's the word, maybe extending, expanding, advancing open source inside of a university context, uh, helping people learn. One other thing that um, that we're trying to do to scale this is tutorials and workshops. So that's that's I think our main way of scaling it out. When, but I. I love the guidelines idea. We're doing that as well. So coming up with things like how to build your Git, your first Git project 
um, how to do demonstrating templates and other things that that do fair um, incorporate fair so that they put the right metadata in for their research projects things like that Mike, your hand is up. Um, one thing that I found oftentimes gets overlooked, but uh, it seems to be really helpful, this idea of IT infrastructure. So whether this is repositories to store data or technologies to help better communicate and like manage pieces of work, right? Sometimes it's just as much as a GitLab instance, but also like, you know, whether like, you know, Zoom meetings that are accessible to people outside the university or something like that um, oftentimes could be useful. This is really good, really helpful. Any other thoughts? I see some folks still writing anonymous raccoon up there who anonymous raccoon is anonymous alligator is also working like you're adding some things what I feel like it's a bouncy lyric thing oh what licenses can I use as a dependency Right. Yeah, I, I see a lot of, particularly in like private sector OSPOs, right? A lot of program offices are really about compliance and ensuring that open source code and other artifacts comply with like existing, you know, obviously when you release something, it's like without liability, but particularly if you're using open source, if you're releasing something as open source, packaging other code, you do have to consider stuff like, you know, is this repackaging proprietary code in some way, or, uh, or am I giving attribution in the way that's mentioned and stuff like that? Um, I don't see that as much in academia, though, just because I think maybe things are not as formalized. I feel like the compliance focus is not, not to say it's not important because license compliance is important, but I think the the risk profile is different than what you see in some of the other companies. So like at, you know, these big tech companies, like, you know, working at places like VMware and Intel, they're, they're just lawsuit targets, right? So you have to be really careful that everything you ship is, um, you know, kind of above reproach. Because because if it's not, someone will find it and then they will try to try to sue you to get a settlement or to get money out of you. Um, whereas I feel like in, in academia, you don't have quite that same risk. That's not to say you shouldn't comply with um, licenses, you certainly should, but I feel like the the focus is different. I think I, I th you'll agree or disagree with that. I think the dimension of uh, technology transfer adds a little bit of nuance to the university case, perhaps. I know my I university still cares about license compliance a great deal, though. I wonder if there's an angle to take at this, like... Um kind of like properly citing works and like I know like the whole there's been a ton of kind of plagiarism accusations as of late in academic circles I, I wonder if the risk profile might be more individualized on like specific researchers particularly as academia becomes more highly politicized but I definitely uh, do agree with you Don like there there's got like the risk factor is has got to be way different um 
but I think it's hard to see how it would emerge just yet because like I think adoption is just much lower. The angle where I'm seeing compliance um, is in the Nelson memo um, ramifications and the the new guidance there to make all research outputs open. And so people are scrambling a little bit to that don't know. Oh wait, I did soft. I have software. You know, a component as a part of my research output. I have to share it. I have to make it open according to the NIH and the NSF grants now. Do you have a link to the Nelson memo, David? Uh, you can just Google Nelson memo, but I oh, okay, <laughs> I could do that. Yes, I can. I, I personally was not even aware of a thing called the Nelson memo. I was only aware of the effects of said memo. <laughs> it's super powerful. I just um, briefed our OVPR staff, all the associate deans of research, and <laughs> they they weren't aware of it either. And it, it sure opened their eyes. Saw someone writing Nelson memo. There we go. Oh, so, all right. Somebody did put the link in there. Yes. All right. All right. Well, I think um, I think this is a this is really helpful. I think it gives us a, a sort of a repertoire of things to consider that might be useful in helping universities advance their open source. This Nelson memo seems like a policy dictate where the awareness of that as it grows toward the end of uh, end of uh, the year. I guess we have a year. We have about one year and 10 months or eight months left to comply. Yeah, that's left for the funders to implement, but some of mm -hmm. them have already started. Yeah, I know my funded federal projects already have that as a requirement, so... I attended some of the presentations in the Year of Open Science conference last week or the week before. I can't remember. And almost every presentation I attended, they were they were talking about the Nelson memo. Okay. Um, all right, and there's uh, so I'll just go down to this. This next thing is uh, from University of Artworks. Any uh, metrics that you want? to see track that we're not currently tracking. Are we tracking any metrics currently? Well, it depends on who you are. But perhaps it, the question is more, are there metrics to be developed or to be applied that are in use? Um, are there things that we haven't thought of or enumerated as memo metrics? Obviously, chaos has like 80 some metrics. Um, so organizational diversity, anonymous IFRIT, whatever that is. Yeah, I suspect the question or I suspect the issue for this group isn't that we haven't defined the metrics that they need. It's probably that we're still trying to figure out what what metrics what metrics are the best ones to to use for universities, right? I mean, do uh, what do where do people feel is like is the gap that the chaos doesn't have enough metrics to find, or is the gap that you need to just start implementing and figuring out what works for Ospos, Claire? Yeah, sorry, I can't find my raise hand gesture. Um, so I I think there's a, there's a number of things. I I think that there are there's a question about what metrics um, would be useful, um, which there are some in use and there are some in use that are not useful and some in use that are useful. Um, so I, I, just to give an example of ones that are in use that are not useful, we did discuss that some of the metrics that are very commonly useful in a broader open source community context may not be useful in an academic context because they 
point people to probably inaccurate um, kind of ideas of success. So for example, a, a, a very successful open source project in a university context may not have a lot of contributors. Um, and that that that's okay. So so there's the idea that there's metrics in use that are not useful in the university context because they give the wrong impression. And then there and then there's there's ones that we don't know how to track. Like for example, how many universe how many projects are being created by my university staff and students because th that that's one that hasn't been easily measured. So we haven't got that one yet. Um, but I want to add in another angle to this because I'm thinking that like it's based on the whole discussion around open access that even if we had that because we have the the new things that have come out with Orc ID being able to be tracked in GitHub and stuff like that which are giving us indicators about how that can be measured. Um, I think one of the bigger problems is the behavioral changes so that it becomes a useful metric because it actually requires people to change their behaviors to make the measurement happen to make it a useful metric. Oh yeah, so I'll, I'll share that. There's this, there, it was just put out like two weeks ago, there was this big announcement about Orc IDs in GitHub. I'll share that link as well. Let me go find that I'll back in a minute. <laughs> Claire is just our link factory today. I, mean, I just, I, it's, <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm starting to see them from everywhere now, you see, I'm on the right <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah, I just linked mine a week or two ago, whenever they announced it. Hold on there. So yeah, I think I think another thing you called out there, Claire, which kind of always lurks in the background in my mind when I'm talking with university people or open source scientific software folks, is that community is not always the goal, and we need ways of determining the health and sustainability of a project for which uh, a large community or more than a dozen contributors is never really likely. Yet the software is and remains critical to some scientific enterprise. You know, the example of IT is like, if I'm if I'm doing research on Parkinson's disease, there's like eight labs in the United States that are really intensely doing that. And there might be one or two pieces of software with a small number of maintainers, but that software is pretty critical for that specific research endeavor. Um, so yeah, how do we, how do we track that? In the scientific space uh, recently. And, and what I suggested to them was that you know, for some of these small projects that really are kind of like one or two people, like the important thing isn't necessarily building a gigantic community around that because it's probably not practical. It doesn't, it's not, it's not what they need to do. What they do need to do is make sure that someone else has the keys to that project and can, if something happens to that maintainer that could, you know, pick up the permissions and be able to maintain it and or cut releases. So, you know, so there, there are some things that are, that are important, but I think are the, the solutions I think are different in the space than, than what you'd find in maybe some of the other open source spaces. Mike, I see your hand. I think um, one thing I've noticed is uh, while, right, there's like a lot of off the shelf software, open source software solutions that are used in academia, whether it's like Linux based operating systems or web development tools or like pandas and NumPy and SciPy and stuff like that. But there's also a lot of like very, very, very poorly cobbled together infrastructure that I would argue impacts research excellence across the board. And so like an example of this is uh, bifurcation of data, right? So like RIT's got an ast big astrophysics center that analyzes gravitational waves. There's like five or six uh, databases that measure gravitational wave data that are hosted by different institutions that have different levels of availability. Some are proprietary, some are open source. The data formats sometimes are the same, sometimes there aren't. And then all of the pipelines for taking that data, ingesting it, developing reports, and making that report reproducible is like up to the individual uh, individual researcher to put together, right? So, you know, obviously no one's really maintaining anything here and the research still seems to come out at least from some institutions that have access to the funding to like do all that work. But when I think about the value of open source in academia, 
It's developing stable shared infrastructure for all these researchers to use together so they can produce research and collaborate in ways that are more streamlined, effective, and consistent in order to speed up the scientific process. So when I hear like, you know, a lot of ac academic open source software doesn't have a lot of contributors and it should be that way. Like in a sense, you know, I get it. The communities will probably be much smaller than something like React or, or whatever. But at the same time, I do think there is like a significant lack of community. And it's because like the research process as a whole, it just, it, it has no resources to develop that shared infrastructure as, as we see it. But with stuff like the Nelson memo and potential you know, funding opportunities and stuff. I, I don't think that's necessarily for sure has to be the way. So I like when thinking about metrics, thinking aspirationally about how we think research should happen and what are the current shortcomings we see in the research process. I'll get off my soapbox. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> Claire has her hand up. Go ahead, Claire. Well, well, first of all, I want to say I completely agree with Mike's soapbox. And of course, we should do all of that and open source research, software engineering, incredibly important. Um, I suppose I want to add to that that I think that, you know, part of the goals that that I that I've heard people describe in universities are that broader community of researchers who may not be building research software in education and indeed students and how they interact with open source being other audiences. Um, and I suppose one of the things I, I want to find the document that we made in that very first workshop we had at Chaos Con back in FOSTEM 12 months ago, because Sean, it like it listed down, I'd say about 12, like yeah. it had a whole list of, of you know metrics we would like which we you could put in here which i which i think mm -hmm. would be great but the but the yeah, point let me find I, that. Actually, yeah the point i wanted to make was actually back to this newer realization that we can have all the metrics in the world if people aren't actually changing their behavior so that they are looking to these metrics or caring about these metrics or doing anything because of the metrics then it won't matter that we've defined them um, and i suppose one thought i've had recently is whether or not it might be we'd be better served rather than trying to describe all the measurements for all the things we might care about to kind of pick the one thing we think everyone should care about or most people should care about to find that and then work on the systems to actually get that metric working and impactful because I, I, and I and the only reason I'm thinking about this is because of this latest thing about the open access metrics where like people are talking about it going down like the open access like document, you know, documents are are disappearing because the actual, you know, curation of them isn't happening right or whatever. And I'm just, it's it's blowing my mind that that, you know, they, I always thought the open access people were a little bit ahead in terms of what they're measuring because they've got the big kind of lists of who's doing what and how how much is open access and all the rest of it. But it doesn't seem to be helping <laughs> the process. So or at least it probably is helping the process that we can see what's happening. But it's doing what a metric should do in that regard, but but it's um, but it seems to be not necessarily helping people get better at what they should be getting better at. Um, so I suppose that's my thought process here is should are is the goal of this group to kind of define a whole load of metrics for all the possible things we should be thinking about, or to look at maybe what's happening now to see if there's something that we could change to better be able to provide value through metrics, but not try to do it all. That's a question I have. Any thoughts on that on Claire's question? Mike, your hand is up. Um I, I think it's a good question. That's my first thought. It's, it's, that's a good question. I, I I can sometimes be a bit of a uh open source bear or like pessimist, I think. Um, I think if we were to measure the health of open source writ large, I think there would be a lot of areas that would be surprising in how much it's it's suffering. And that's just kind of more anecdotal 
than than like empirical. And so when when thinking about metrics, um, I I imagine kind of like. I guess two main use cases. The first is to to help prioritize what things need work and where to put in efforts. But then oftentimes there's this like lurking monster in the background that's like your CEO or provost or whatever that wants like the dashboard that shows line goes up uh, so they don't like, you know, put you on the chopping block. And so it's that monster in the background that makes me nervous about like putting in a ton of metrics that we know are going to be, you know, performing poorly or stagnant for a very long time uh, because it requires like so much institutional change in order to achieve. Um, and so like Claire, to your point, it might be uh, like when thinking about metrics, I like the idea of like maybe labeling certain ones if they're like, you know, unlikely to change in the immediate future, they can be like, I don't know, deprioritized or put on the back burner um, until like we're in the future and we've solved all of these problems, uh, hopefully. But I'd be curious what other folks think. I'm also wondering if maybe we should use some of this, some of the time in these meetings to have um, a few of you who've been in the space for a longer time. So I'm thinking, Mike, people like you, maybe Claire, maybe, um, you know, Stephanie from Cross. Um, just give like a, you know, like a 15 minute presentation about what you've learned about, you know, using metrics in a university setting. You know, like some of the stuff you were talking about, Mike, that, you know, being cautious about which ones you select because, you know, your provost or somebody might not be, might not be super excited if the lines aren't going up and to the left. Um, you know, I don't know if that, first of all, I don't know if people like Mike and Claire and Stephanie would be up for spending time to put together a presentation to give to this group. And I'm not sure if it would be valuable for the rest of you. What, what do people think? We have one thumbs up from Daniel in the chat, or not in the chat, in the pictures. David, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I think that would be valuable. Um, I'm still making the decision of, do I even do metrics? Um, and I, I get confused between, you know, do I want to track the open source use at the university or the projects that are being built or the research projects or the, you know, just the larger community projects, people that might be contributing to outside projects? Um, I don't even know what to measure. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit lost at this point. So that, that would be helpful to me. Mike, and I'm a little yourself. intimidated, too, about like what tools to install, how to install them and how much work's involved to, to get to those measurements. Um, I can definitely uh, back up David in that nervousness. Uh, I mean, having like, <laughs> it's weird. I don't feel like I'm new at this, but um, I, I, I understand the point. Or sorry, I don't feel like I've been doing this for a long time. I do feel like I'm new at this. Uh, I think from our case, you know, our use of metrics has not been in a structured way, right? It's not like we've uh, stood up, you know, Augur and are collecting like a diverse set of repository health metrics for like a range of a hundred projects at our university. The, the best that we've done is some weird GitHub API querying to try to find, uh, you know, projects developed by university faculty and staff, uh, as well as like basic target metrics that we've had for programs where it's like, you know, we helped 26 different open source projects at RIT, but they weren't really necessarily like quantitative, 
right? It, outside of that one figure, it was more like, here's the services we do, uh, deliver. And, you know, frankly, like for a lot of the community building services that we did deliver, we obviously like don't speak about this super highly, but a lot of them like didn't have a huge uptick in contributors, right? And like, honestly, a lot of them, our goals of assisting them wasn't necessarily uh, to like provide this huge quality, quantitative change in like the amount of people working on it and stuff like that. But rather it was to provide like additional stability to a project to like reduce faculty researcher burnout to help them get a grant, which only now are we seeing the effects of that. So I can, I'd be happy to like put together some slides or do a little 15 minute spiel uh, talk on like kind of that. But a lot of it's like any sort of impact that we have on any specific project, it's, it's a super long tail, right? And this has been certainly for our office, that's all pretty much grant funded. This is like the fundamental problem, right? Is any investment we have it takes a long time before we really see the value of that and uh and you know how that works with funding cycles being like very long as well uh it makes things tricky um daniel i see your hands up yeah i think um it's worth recognizing those contributions and it um it can be it can feel like they're not you know, dramatically impactful or that the long tail is is hard to see. But I think for people who are entering the space, just even understanding what the the normal is, what the expected behaviors are, is really, really, really valuable. And the, and building that baseline of assumptions of what is what is normal, do what is the <laughs> what is acceptable and what is sort of like just the default. It, it's not necessarily obvious if you come from various backgrounds. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's good. I think it would be good. <laughs> and the other thing too, getting back to, you know, David's comment about what do you, what do you measure and what tools do you pick? And it's all, it's also overwhelming, frankly. Um, what, what I actually encourage people to do is to, to start with kind of a manual look at, at things and it gives you a sense for maybe some of the things you need to look at because you know honestly like what which even amongst the the two chaos um you know chaos software packages which one you pick depends on what you're what you're trying to do and what you're interested in and what you think you're going to need and and frankly until you until you poke around the things a little bit you probably you probably don't know what you need and so i think you know, starting with poking around in a few things in either the GitHub user interface or the GitHub, uh, you know, API, I think is is not a bad way to start. And I think, you know, looking at what you're trying to accomplish as an OSPO and what you've what you've said you're going to do, and picking a couple of things to measure based based on that is a really good starting point. Um, and so I would encourage you just to you know to start with something and and then decide decide where to go from from there. I mean that's often that's often how I've approached metrics. I've you know despite having things like the chaos tools, I I also have loads of scripts that hit the GitHub API for just down and dirty things where I just need to you know to look at activity on on projects that I may or may not have in an Augur database. And so. I don't know. I kind of like the the DIY approach while you figure out what you need and then you can figure out the best, you know, the best software, the best metrics, like what what else you need to build on that. I I just want to to kind of comment on that cuz I think it's great but but to reflect on that previous conversation about the once you have a metric, everyone rallies around the metric um, kind of instinct. Um, I'm just wondering if just this, we should, we should be explicit about the idea that you should think about what you can see and think about what you talk about what you can see. Um, so, so the kind of the, the disclosure of the fact that this is a tracking metric might be different than actually having, experimenting with those metrics. Um, 
because there is an instinct there's an instinct to kind of say oh i i'm experimenting with this metric here it is and then it becomes this like somehow built into a scorecard somewhere which is what you don't want right so because it's the only thing you can measure um so i suppose maybe it'd be really important for us to make that distinction to say you know beware of that yeah as, absolutely. As experimenting <laughs> absolutely I do think that report outs should come with the narratives about what what things mean um, because people get people get too hung up on on the the charts and whether things are going up or down um, in ways that's that's or, or or the idea of actually having a goal which could be a very tiny little increase that you go green on you know like like a like a traffic light uh, uh, indication of a measurement just to show that you think it's perfectly fine that we're flatlining this particular metric that's okay based on our goals. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I temporarily stopped the sharing because I don't know why. But that's not the right one anyway. Wish somehow I ended up on the wrong. Apologize. My sharing crashed, and no, I'm not sharing anymore. Well, we have five minutes, so yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, Claire shared the previously generated list of goals, so I put a link to that at the bottom of these minutes. Um, that might warrant um, a little bit of discussion in the future, maybe at the next meeting. But is there anything they're, anyone else? They're, they're quite similar to that framework that, you know, I think they were the basis upon which we worked on that framework that we had, the square mm -hmm. questions and things. We skipped the agenda item that Claire put on. Oh. About meeting up in the fall. Oh, thank you so much typing. So Claire, you mentioned you have to travel to OSS in September. Well, so well, so, so uh, yeah, that, this was based on a conversation that seemed to happen last week that I missed. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to kind of make sure that we keep that on there. So, so I'm certainly planning to be at the OSS EU summit that's um in September. And I'm very interested to, if there people want to do a meetup there, I'd be very interested in, I I, I mean, I, I thought that maybe ChaosCon, I don't know, might be doing something there or not, or Chaos might be, I don't know. If not, yeah. I would love to know if people would be interested in going there and perhaps even putting in something like a panel discussion on this topic. I think a panel discussion would be great. Yeah, and I think there will be, there will be quite a few of us from the Chaos Project, I imagine, that will, will be there. It'll depend on whose talks get accepted, but yeah. I think you should see who who would be up for a panel. So consider that an open question. I'll put it in the Slack as well. And then if anyone is 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 interested, let me know. Well, there's a submission, I think, by the end of April for the CFP. Yeah, I think so. I think. So our next meeting is actually probably after that um, because there's no meetings in two weeks. And so then our next meeting would be four weeks, which would be pretty close to the end of April, possibly back past the OSS EU deadline, Claire. Okay. Um, so maybe what we want to do is try to coordinate this asynchronously. May 1. Yep. Thank you, Elizabeth. I was about to jump to a calendar to try to figure out when four weeks was. And I just, uh, I'd only come up here to make a note that we discussed the fall meetup again. But so maybe, maybe we use uh, two minutes we have. Does, does anyone else like Mike, are you going to be at OSS EU? Would you be interested in being on a panel with Claire? I would be interested and I'd be happy to help out. Um, travel funding is kind of weird going into this year, but like, regardless, you can, Help me in as someone that would be happy to contribute and, um, you know. Where is OSSEU this year? Vienna. The Austria? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Austria. Nice. Yeah. So it's Europe. So, uh, you know, there's cheap cheap flights, at least. Um, so, yeah, feel free to count me down if you would uh, like me to participate. And as always, I'd be happy to collaborate asynchronously over Slack or whatever your proposal. That sounds good. Yeah, I feel like that's going to be a little bit harder because a lot of the a lot of the uh, groups that have funded OSPOs are U.S. based, and I know travel budgets are 
uh, stretched right now. Sometimes Linux Foundation does give travel budgets if you ask them. Um, I know their rules are always changing, but that's another option too. Yeah, that's um, that's worth considering. Yeah, that's um, I think especially true if you work for a not for profit organization. Um, but even so, I I know people who work at even large companies who had talks accepted who were going to cancel their talks, and the Linux Foundation paid for their travel instead. Um, so they've been pretty generous with travel stipends. So I would say it's it's worth it's worth thinking about if you can spare the time. All right, that sounds good. Um, I think that's about the end of time. Oops, sorry, go just, ahead, Claire. No, just before we go on, and based on the conversation there, for May 11th, um, do you think we could actually maybe get some folks to share some of their experience based on the conversation here today? Maybe we could get some people to volunteer to do exactly what you said. I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to share anecdotes, but I don't have a lot of experience with the broader university treatment of metrics and danger areas or things that work. Yeah. But it sounds, I, I'd, love, sounds like... I'd love to hear it too, so. I don't know if we can do that asynchronously as well, maybe in between now and May 11th to see if we can yeah. get some people. Would you yeah. mind prompting people in the Slack channel, Claire? I'll do that too. I'll do that too. Yeah. Thank how you. about how about you, Mike? Would you be up for doing something on May 1st? Yeah, I can do a super informal, uh, like throw like 15 minutes thing. I can do that. Um, yeah, I'm writing a very large grant this uh this month, but I, if it's May 1st, I should, should be able to throw it together. Sounds good. May 1st or May 11th? Did I say May 11th? May 1st. You said May 11th, but it's May 1st. Oh, okay. I don't know why I said, I, I, I read but it wrong. An extra, just an extra one. You want to be I'm number seeing one double. Twice. I'm seeing double yeah. <laughs> in, in the text. <laughs> All right, well, we are at time. So if there's a, uh, I think we should uh, say thank you and uh, see you in uh, four weeks and on the asynchronous connections. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye, Talk bye. to you soon.